The second speaker for the morning will be Professor Stuart Kaufman. Um, so he has done a lot of work on theoretical biology and evolution. And in fact, um, as an undergraduate in the National University of Singapore, in the late 90s, you know, we, came, uh, we, we got to know about his NK model, which was written, of course, uh, I think one decade before I, I became an undergraduate. Uh, we, you know, we were very fascinated about you know, how this simple model of our, uh, Boolean variables could evolve and represent uh, evolutionary biological, uh, biological complexity. And then after that, you know, I kind of uh, we I kind of lost, you know, uh, we I kind of went off in a different direction, uh, doing condensed matter theory for my PhD. And then uh, it's only after coming back to NTU where I started working on complex systems uh, uh, from a fresh perspective uh, that I got in touch, uh, got got to know about uh, Prof uh, Stewart's uh, work again. So in 2015, in, uh, I met, met him in uh, 2015 in Tempe, uh, Arizona, because that was the first time that the Conference on Complex Systems moved out of Europe and went global. So it was hosted by uh, Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. Uh, and I, I was actually talking to Professor Yane Bayam about you know, his, uh, his uh, keynote talk that morning. Uh, and then uh, here came uh, Stewart, he's, you know, he joined the conversation and then uh, you know, these two big figures in uh, complex system science attracted more and more people. So effectively, we have a mini seminar outside the seminar room, uh, right, right in the corridor. Uh, and I was very uh, happy that he remembered me uh, when I met him again in 2016 in Amsterdam. So I, because, you know, uh, Asian faces all look alike. I mean, <laughs> I mean, maybe, you know, Caucasian faces all look alike to Asians as well. But uh, I, I was very happy that he actually remembered me. Uh, from 2015 in, uh, Ari in, in uh, Arizona. Um, uh, and he gave a keynote address uh, in 2016 in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, I, want, I want to say that you know, uh, my experience talking to people in, in the audience was that it was a very polarizing uh, talk. There were people who were very, very uh, excited about the talk and also people who were a little bit skeptical. Uh, but I think you know, the being polarizing is the hallmark of a great thinker. But uh, let, let me not waste time here and then welcome Stuart to come here and uh, tell us about the, the, how biology and the evolution of life you know, can be understood as something beyond physics. Thank you. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Jan, thank you for inviting me from wherever I came from. Um, Brian Arthur is here uh, and we're very old friends. And uh, we're supposed to be dressed kind of casual uh, and uh, Brian, I would be wearing the tie, but you have it. This is an old joke from the Santa Fe Institute. It's just, just for you, Brian. Uh, so I'm going to talk on a, a, just a small topic, uh, beyond physics, the emergence and evolution of life. And what I hope to show you is um, we cannot reduce biology to physics. The biosphere is a persistent, fulminant becoming. Um, and the question is how? What's going on? It becomes a larger and larger thing to me every day. One of the issues is, is evolution in the sense of the evolving biosphere open-ended, or will it stop? Uh, a beautiful article is coming out by Erstroth Mari uh, called roughly Grand Visions of Evolution, and Strath Mari, who's in Budapest, wonders too, is, is the evolution of the biosphere open-ended? I think it is, and the question is why? No, I think what I have to do is find something and push it. So too much of this is written. I am just learning how to do PowerPoint. And, and uh, you'll have to apologize. I cannot do nice figures. My wife can. I can't. She has one, too, but that's a separate issue. So I want to talk about the historicity of the universe. So let me begin the following way. Has the universe made all possible stable atoms? There's about 100 kinds of stable atoms. And the answer is, of course it has. Now let's ask, above the level of atoms, what about proteins? Well, I think you all know that a protein is 20 kinds of amino acids strung together like beads on a string. How many possible proteins are there with 20, 200 amino acids in them? Well, the answer is 20 times 20 times 20 times 20, 200 times. So that's 20 to the 200th. That's 10 to the 260th possible proteins length 200. There's 10 to the 80th particles in the universe. 
The fastest time scale, we have physicists in the room, is the Planck time scale of 10 to the minus 43rd seconds. If 10 to the 80th particles were doing nothing every Planck time scale, ignoring space-like separation, whatever that is, but making proteins length 200, how long would it take to make all possible proteins length 200 once? And the answer is the age of the universe raised to 10 to the 39th power. This means something physical. What it means is, when considering proteins length 200, the universe is in a tiny, infinitesimally small subset of possible proteins. That means that the universe is what the physicists called vastly non-ergotic. It will not visit all possible states. This means something huge. We will not make all possible proteins. We will not make, mo the universe will not make most complex things. It, it just won't come to happen. That means that the becoming of the universe, as our previous speaker said, is as Heraclitus said, a becoming. We will not step into the same universe twice. What's going on? Okay, so uh, there's another thing to be said here. The more complex things are, the more sparsely the universe can sample the space of that complexity. We can make all pairs of two atoms, but we can't make all things of 150,000 atoms. So we sample the space ever more sparsely as we go up in complexity. Now, consider the human heart. I think I trained as a doctor. Um, I think it's true that you all have a heart. If you haven't, I ask you to please leave if you can manage it, because it's hard without a heart. Um, now, a heart's a complex thing. How come hearts exist in the universe? Where the hell did hearts come from? You all have them. So I'm going to try to get to that. Uh, and since the Big Bang. Now, a quick answer to it is that hearts abet survival. They help you live. So they've come to exist in this non-ergotic universe through the emergence and evolution of life. This becoming is a non-ergotic, hence historical process. It's an historical process. History enters when the space of the possible is vastly larger than what can happen. Now, I want to talk about one way to get to exist in the non-ergotic universe. There's a notion of a Kantian whole, named, of course, after Immanuel Kant, who's talking about organisms, and he says, an organized being, then, has the property that the parts exist for and by means of the whole. The parts exist for and by means of the whole, OK? Now, I'm going to be talking an awful lot about collectively autocatalytic sets uh, and their Kantian holes. They're a very simple example of it. Let me tell it to you, and then you're going to be seeing more of it than you want to see. A guy named Gona Ashkenazi in the Ben-Gurion, who we'll see in about 10 days, has one. He has a, a small protein is called a peptide. He has nine peptides, each of which catalyzes, catalysis means to speed up a reaction. Each peptide catalyzes the reaction, forming the next peptide around a cycle till the last peptide catalyzes the formation of the first. This is a Kantian whole. Each Peptide gets to exist for and by means of the set of the nine peptides, which collectively make one another. So we'll come back to this a lot. That's a Kantian whole. I'm going to be telling you that this, which I call or is called a collectively autocatalytic set, you are too. You make all your own parts. Okay, so we'll be talking a lot about that. If I can now press the right button. So I'm going to use the word function. In biology and in, in, in economics, we use the function. The function of your heart is to pump blood. Now, the word function doesn't exist in physics. So let's look at this a little more carefully. You see, the function of your heart is to pump blood. I trained in medicine. It's also true that it makes heart sounds. I, I know you don't know that. You didn't train in medicine, but, but I did. Um, but it also jiggles water in your pericardial sac. The function of your heart is to pump blood. It's the function by virtue of which it exists. It's not to jiggle water in your pericardial sac. This is already part of why we cannot reduce biology to physics. If function talk is OK, the function of a part is a subset of its causal consequences, pumping blood, not jiggling water. Why is that legitimate? In physics, there's only the causal consequences of things in classical physics. Quantum physics is more complex. So I've said it here. It's a subset of its box. So for this collectively autocatalytic set of peptides, the function of peptide 1 is to catalyze the formation of peptide 2. It doesn't matter whether it jiggles the water in the Petri plate, right? We can justify function talk 
in a non-ergodic universe where a complex thing gets to exist because it makes itself and the function of the parts is just to be a Kantian whole. Now, that says 2C. Functions are a legitimate category in the science in historical becoming of this non-ergodic universe for biospheres. So I've already said 2D. 2E tells us where we're going to get. We will see in this presentation that what gets to exist in the non-ergodic universe above the level of atoms in the evolving biosphere includes ever new, unprestatable functions that abet the survival of the organisms having those functions, for example, eyes and sight, and it's going to follow that biology cannot again be reduced to physics, if I can get through the talk. Okay, so here's a collectively autocatalytic set, and I think that I can use this little pointer there. So you're going to see this, I'm afraid, more than once. I want to thank, many years later, Don Farmer and Norm Packard at Los Alamos, who joined me in creating this. So here's what you're looking at. Um, that is a I better walk over here. This, this is AABAA. -A -A. It's supposed to be a little teeny protein made of two. Can you hear me? Can you hear me all right? What? what? Give me the tie. Right. It's supposed to be a little protein made of two kinds of amino acids. So circles surround little molecules. Okay. There's AABAA, -A -A, and there's BAABAB. -A -A now, Circles surround molecules. Dots represent reactions. So let's see if we can see. Oh, I want. I guess I wanted. Uh, yeah, I wanted B A A B B and. Uh, let me see. B A B. Dots represent reactions. So let's look at this one. B A B, and something, my goodness, I should have looked at this before, BAB and BAA joined together to make BAABAB, -A -A -B. finally I found it. So a dot represents a reaction, the lines go from the substrates to the product. This is called a bipartite graph, there's two kinds of things, there's dots and circles. Every dot sends an arrow into a circle, and every circle sends a, uh, an arrow into a dot, so it's two kinds of things. It's also got dotted lines. This thing from A, A, B, A, A, since a dotted line that goes from the circle into the dot representing a reaction, that means that this, this molecule catalyzes that reaction. That's what's going on in this. There are molecules, there's reactions, and molecules catalyze the reaction. This is called mathematically a bipartite hypergraph. The dotted little arrows are, are uh, making a hypergraph. So this is a collectively autocatalytic set. And if one examines it, you'll see that it reproduces itself, but we're not going to. It has to be fed from the outside. This is a non-equilibrium chemical system, and I've circled A, B, 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 the, all of the monomers and dimers. They're the food set. Stuff's pouring in from the outside. This is a persistently non-equilibrium chemical system. So these systems only work if they're displaced from chemical equilibrium. Okay. Now... I'm moving us towards absolutely brilliant work that two young scientists, Niall Monteville and Matteo uh, Mosio, have done. Uh, we'll get to that in a bit. And Niall uh, needs a job. So if any of you wishes to look at him, I hope you do. I started this in a book called Investigations, and I was trying to think about work cycles. There are many physicists in the room. I hope I insult you. I, I'm going to try. All right, this is fun. So let's go back to um, let's go back to look at 3A up above. What's what's work? Well, go to an elementary physics textbook. It says work is a force acting through a distance. So here's the hockey puck, and I accelerate it. We don't in the United States, but we might, and it goes faster and faster. I've, work has been done on the hockey puck. Already this is interesting and not noted in the physics books. Who picked the direction in which the hockey puck is accelerated? There's got to be a direction. To hold that, now we will get to a brilliant book by Peter Atkins. And Atkins, in his, that's 3B, says, work is a thing. It's the cons this, is, this is real physical work. Work is the release of energy into a few degrees of freedom. So what does that mean? 
it means degrees of freedom means the possible ways that energy could be released, and a few degrees of freedom means not all of them, only some of them. So I've drawn it here, okay? I'm very proud of this drawing. You, you can see why I might be. This is a canon. You can tell I wrote canon. It's mathematical. And this is a cannonball, and the cannonball is inside of the cannon, and there's a little space there where there's powder, and the powder explodes. But because the powder is inside the cannon, it can't explode in all directions, and the exploding powder and exploding gases does thermodynamic work on the cannonball and sends it out the mouth of the cannon. That's work. It's the constrained release of energy. Now, pause here and imagine that there was a kind of a hole in the cannon. The cannon wouldn't work as well, right? A lot of the gas would escape through the cannon. This is something that it's hard to get our minds around. The constraint works because of what does not happen. What does not happen is the gases don't squirt out the side into the, into the air. Terry Deacon struggles with this too. Constraints work because they only allow some, but not all things to happen. Okay, I'm extraordinarily proud of the fong. This is non-propagating work. What happens is the cannonball hits the ground and it makes a hole and hot dirt. So this is I'm going to call not propagating work. Okay. I'm now going to introduce some, some um, way of drawing this that, that uh, I guess I worked on and Mael and, and, uh, and Matteo have done. So please just see this and understand it. I'm going to represent a non-equilibrium process. The gas exploding is a non-equilibrium exergonic process. So this is an exergonic process. Oh, doggone. This is an, an exergonic process. A is going to be, that's the powder exploding. A, that, that little at sign is because I did it on my computer. So that, 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 that's a process. And C1 up above is a constraint. That's the cannon, and the cannon with that little blue arrow constrains the release of energy so that that process actually does work. It, it does work on the cannonball and thrusts it out the cannon. Everybody got it? It's a, it's a, it's a very abstract picture. I love it. So, but then I realized something some years ago. What do the physicists do with the cannon and the cannonball? There's physicists in the room. You guys put in fixed and moving boundary conditions, and then you solve for the work done. But I'm a biologist, and I know that the Big Bang happened. And I ask the following question. Where did the canton come from since the Big Bang? Uh, that's a fair question. The answer is it took work to make the canon. Yes? Canons don't just happen. It took work to make the canon. So that means something strange. It means that if you, if you don't have constraints on the release of energy, you don't get work. But typically, if you don't have any work, you don't get constraints. Let me call that the constraint work cycle. It's not always true. You can have something like a, a bunch of lipids that fall to a low energy structure called a liposome. Uh, but it often takes work to make constraints, and it always takes constraints to make work. This is going to be pushing us along. So I'm going to call that the work constraint cycle. In investigations, I also, uh, I also I created something that, again, I'm extraordinarily proud of. So here, here it is. This is a cannon. Actually, it's the same cannon. And the cannon fires the same cannonball. But before I fired the cannonball, I went out and I dug a hole that's a well. And I erected a paddle wheel over it. You can tell it's a paddle wheel. It says paddle wheel. The cannonball hits the cannon, the, hits the paddle wheel, and makes it spin. When it spins, I've tied a rope onto the paddle, onto the, I'm sorry, onto the bucket, and the rope goes up to the bucket, and it winds the bucket up to the top of the paddle wheel, spills the water over into a funnel, which goes down, and opens the flat valve, and it waters my bean field. When I did this, the Milagro Bean Field Award in Santa Fe was very popular, and this is Kaufman's bean field. It's in Santa Fe. Well, this is what I'm calling propagating work. What's the difference between this and the one before? A lot of macroscopic things happen in the world, right? Well, let's look at the constraints. The cannon's a constraint on the release of energy. Um, the firing of that powder is exergonic. It does work on the cannonball, which comes out and hits the paddle wheel. 
and it makes the paddle wheel spin, well, it's doing work on the paddle wheel. Is it that the constrained release of energy? Of course it is. You see, the paddle wheel spins around the axle of the paddle. That constrains the release of energy. Having done that, that does work on the rope and pulls it up and dumps it over into the funnel that then goes down and does actual work on the flat valve to open it and waters my bean field. And the, the plants grow, which is part of what I want to get to. So that's propagating work. Every machine does propagating work. An automobile does propagating work. The gas explodes and the wheels turn. There's a bunch of stuffing between called rods and pistons and crank sh shafts and gears and escapements and so on that make it all go around. Everything we design like that does propagating work. We just don't call it that. Now, I'm going to use the following way of noting it that, that uh, Mael and Mateo have. So that's a non-equilibrium process that's constrained by a constraint. That's the exploding powder doing work on the, on the cannonball because of the constraint due to the cannon. So that's constraint one. Then the cannonball hits the paddle wheel and makes it spin. On, hits, I'm sorry, is the paddle wheel spinning? And the constraint is the axle in the paddle wheel. This is so strange. We're not used to thinking about this. But it's right. OK. So the way I'm going to show propagating work is this. Notice that the constraints are there from the beginning. In the, in the watering the bean field example, I constructed all of the constraints on the release of energy. But could work once done construct the constraint? Sure. Why not? So let's look down here. Here's the same thing, same thing. But this, this end turns out to be the construction of constraint. In the case that you just saw, the water, instead of pouring into the funnel, it's the side of the hill, flows down the hill, uh, erodes a groove in the hill, and that, that groove in the hill, that little valley, replaces the tube that I had, and now the water can flow down to my bean field without going through the tube. Work was just done to construct a constraint. The constraint is, in fact, the little gully that's running down to my bean field. Work can be done to construct constraints. Now I'm going to tell you Mile and Matteo's idea, and I keep waiting for people to say, that's fantastic, and nobody does. They will be listening. Please say fantastic. Please. Okay. You, you, I, I'm in love with this. So I got almost to this in investigation. I said somehow life is doing propagating work that is somehow self-constructing. That was 20 years ago. A year ago, Mael and Matteo set it. And here it is. It's exactly what we saw before. There's the constraint on the release of energy that does a second constraint on the release of energy. There's a third constraint on the release of energy that makes a fourth constraint, which is identical to the first constraint. It closes. They call it constraint closure. Nobody says yay. Please say yay. Yay. Maya, see? I, I. <laughs> so, so this is astonishing as we begin to think about it. We'll see that the collectively autocatalytic set of peptides does exactly this. It takes a while to grok it. So let me back up for a moment. In physics, Newton told us, I have these differential equations that give the, the forces between the balls in, in, in his, his laws. And you know you need the initial and the boundary conditions. Newton never tells you where the boundary conditions come from. We, we stick them in, OK? What is the canon? It's a boundary condition. The constraint literally is a boundary condition, right? We're talking about a system that harnesses its own boundary conditions to non-equilibrium processes that construct the very same set of boundary conditions. This is a machine that constructs itself. It couples non-equilibrium processes to the constrained release of energy, which is work, that it uses to construct the boundary conditions on the same release of energy by which it makes itself. I think it does something absolutely magnificent. So there it is. I'm going to say we'll see it several times. It's a machine that does a work cycle. We'll see that it does a work cycle to build and assemble its own working parts. Cars don't do this. Cars, cars do propagating work and go down the road. They do not build themselves. At this point, think about the fact that whether we're in Singapore or in the redwoods of Northern California, trees construct themselves. 
a seed is planted, and some years later, there's this thing going up in the air. It literally built itself. How did that happen? This is how it happened. Trees build themselves. You built yourself from a fertilized egg. You literally physically constructed yourself. You might not have been aware of it, but you did. So that's what's going on here. That's what these guys have found. Now, so I'm going to say this several ways. Life is fundamentally, I can come back over here now. Life is fundamentally a new linking of non-equilibrium processes and constraints on the release of energy in such processes into a few degrees of freedom that thus is thermodynamic work. But stunningly, the work done in one such non-equilibrium process as its energy is released can construct constraints on the release of energy in further non-equilibrium processes. In reproducing cells, systems such as cells, this is a closure, and it's achieved linking these non-equilibrium processes and constraint construction into an organization of process that closes on itself. So the non-equilibrium work done by the constraint release of energy constructs the same constraints in a thermodynamic work cycle. I'm going to just say that. Okay, then go on to the next slide. So if we now imagine that these things are able to do this propagating work, this is, this is how organisms construct themselves. And if we now have, and we'll get to it, heritable variation and natural selection, which I hope to get to shortly, we're going to get something that can build a biosphere. The biosphere is building itself and propagating diversity. So I realized something strange when I was thinking about this. 200 years ago, people talked about vitalism. It was the vital force. It was some exogenous magic force inside of living things. Nobody knew what it was. This is what it is. It's a coupling of constraint construction, constraints on the release of energy that does work to construct the same constraints. This is vitalism. Okay? Or, as a matter of fact, this is the life force. This is the life force that, that, uh, that puzzled the ancients. That's it. Okay? Um, so I'm going to say it again. The ancients, uh, the ancients dismissed the idea of vitalism, but it's precisely what we've just said. Now, so far I've shown you one that exists. Maela and Mateo showed us one. Fine. But how did they come into existence since the Big Bang? Nobody was there. It was exactly as you said, George. There was, there was nobody around. So how did it happen? And I'm now going to show you at least one view of how life started. This is the problem of the origin of life. So I'm going to tell you about a, a, a model that, in fact, I invented a long time ago. And a lot of work has been done on it. And I've already shown it to you. So let me sort of say it in words. I'm going to model a molecule as a binary string of A's and B's. I'm going to model reactions by letting binary strings glue together end to end, a ligation reaction, or break apart a cleavage reaction. So I'm going to show this as a reaction graph. It's going to show what you've already seen, circles around molecules, arrows going into little dots that represent reactions, and going on to products. So it's a bipartite graph. And then I'm going to assign what molecule catalyzes what reaction at random. So I, I did this many, many years ago, 1971, and it's called the binary polymer model. And what happens is, and I can guess, I can get this idea, well, I'm, I'll show it to you in a better way. Um, so I'm going to show you that the emergence of, have I gone ahead? So this is the theory of the spontaneous emergence of collectively autocatalytic sets. They could be peptides, they could be RNA, they could be all kinds of things. To my astonishment, they perform work cycles and they achieve constraint closure. I've known about this since 1971. It was my idea. I had no idea that they achieved constraint closure and did work cycles. So uh, that's it. It's a set of food molecules, reactions, and catalyzed and uncatalyzed reactions. To tune your intuitions, I'm going to take you back to 1956 and talk about graphs. So this is the evolution of a graph by Erdős and Renier, 1956. Just look at the picture on the bottom. It consists in the following. I've got a bare floor, and I've got a bunch of, I've got a bunch of white buttons on the floor. It won't work if they're not white. Then I take a spool of red thread. 
I break off a piece of red thread and I randomly pick up two white buttons and I tie them together. And I just do that process over and over and over again. I pick another, another pair of random buttons and I tie them together with a red thread. So what happens? Well, so here I've got, I think I've got 20 buttons and I've got one, two, three, four, I guess five threads. So what happens is astonishing. I have a very large number of buttons and a very large number of threads. Every now and then pick up a button and see how many buttons you lifted up with it. That's called a component or a cluster. Think of the size of the largest cluster as you keep tying buttons together. What happens is a sudden phase transition where all of a sudden almost all of the buttons get connected into a giant cluster. It's called a giant component in an Erdos-Renier random graph. And you can see it here. Here, then all of a sudden they're getting connected. Here they're pretty much connected. You have the intuition? OK. That's what's going to give rise to autocatalytic sets. It's going to be the analogous phase transition in this bipartite graph that represents reactions in molecules when enough reactions are catalyzed by the molecules. So you get that. In words, if you have enough molecules and enough reactions, if the molecules have a chance to catalyze the reactions with some probability, when enough reactions are catalyzed, everything gets connected and it pops out of nowhere that you've got to collect the autocatalytic set. It works. It's, there are theorems, and there's 30 years of experiments with it. So I want to believe that this is how life started. I'm going to tell you evidence for it. I'm going to tell you that it runs contrary to the standard view, um, and we'll find out soon. So let me tell you, well, let me tell you the standard view. People believe uh, in the origin of life theory that, uh, that life is necessarily based on template replicating DNA or RNA molecules. You all know the famous double helix. And the idea is that the Watson strand melts in the Crick strand, and that the Watson you can't hear me. Okay, well, maybe I'm. Gee, and I've got the lapel. Okay, so the standard view for years has been that life must be based on template replicating either RNA or DNA. Uh, and you all know the famous double helix. Uh, the idea is that if you have a single-stranded RNA molecule, it will line up the nucleotides that constitute the other strand, and then they'll get linked together to form the, the, the second strand. So the strand one, the Watson strand, will manage to make a Crick strand, and then they'll melt apart and cycle. Leslie Orgel has been trying it for 40 years. He died recently. Nobody has succeeded. It might work, but it hasn't. Meanwhile, almost all of the workers out in the field think you must have template replicating DNA or RNA to get molecular reproduction. They're wrong. So I will show you that now. So Gonan Ashkenazi in the Ben Gurion uh, has nine small proteins. And as I told you at the beginning, each protein catalyzes a reaction making the next protein around a cycle. It's collectively autocatalytic. Proteins make molecular reproducing systems. It is a fact of the world that you do not need RNA or DNA. Of course, RNA or DNA could make a collective autocatalytic set. And Gunter von Kederowski in 1997 or 94 made a collectively autocatalytic set of little DNA fragments. And recently, Jerry Joyce has made one with RNA molecules. Most recently, Niles Lehman at Portland State uh, has taken uh, about 20 ribozymes, or specially evolved RNA molecules, cut them in half, put them in a pot, and and they evolve spontaneously into a collectively autocatalytic set with nine members. So it works. Those are evolved RNA sequences. At the moment, uh, Niles Lehman is trying to do it with random RNA sequences. We'll see if it works or not, I, I hope. Now I want to show you the crux thing in 4C. Gonan's set achieves exactly Mael and Mateo's constraint closure. So again, I want to go through this slowly. Ashkenazi set has nine peptides. They're linked cyclically. The nine peptides are linked. Each catalyzes, let's do this slowly. Peptide one catalyzes the reaction forming a second copy of peptide two. That next copy of each peptide is formed like peptide two in a reaction in two fragments of peptide two which are glued together. A new peptide bond is formed to make a second copy of peptide two. This reaction is non-equilibrium. You have to feed in the fragments. It's a non-equilibrium system. Uh, 
Each such reaction is catalyzed by the prior peptide. Peptide 1 catalyzes the formation of peptide 2 by gluing together two fragments of 2. Something just happened. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So, so, and the way the peptide 1 does it is it lowers the energy barrier of the reaction. So that reaction energy, it's a non-equilibrium reaction, is the constraint release of energy in making peptide do, and it does work. Proof that it does work is a new peptide bonds form. So each, each reaction in this cycle does exactly one of Mayl and Mateo's steps. It does work on the constrained release of energy to build the next peptide around a cycle that mutually builds one another. It achieves constraint closure. Furthermore, it does the work cycle. It rebuilds all of its parts. So the set that I've been in love with since 1971 does what I didn't realize. It does achieve constraint closure. Okay. So, so I hope that this is how we can get to a self-reproducing system. It may be that it's template replicating RNA or DNA. That would be another form of autocatalysis, but template replicating. Let's imagine that that part's been done in the next 20 years. I now want to tell you all something that, that um, you'll be very impressed by my transparency. I want to get a collected metabolism. You, you see, you have about 1,000 to 2,000 to 5,000 molecules in a complex reaction network in, in, in you, in your cells. Where did that come from? How did it form? How in the origin of life did we ever get a connected, catalyzed metabolism with hundreds of reactions among hundreds of molecules all being catalyzed? I want to show you that that too can arise as the Erdos-Renier buttons and thread phase transition. Not too many people have thought about this, but I'm going to show it to you next. So I hope that you're impressed with my drawing. I did it yesterday on a, you saw where I did it, okay? So it's the same thing. Dots represent molecules and boxes now represent reactions. So this is an uncatalyzed reaction graph. There's molecules and reactions, and you can see from the arrows where things go. Everybody? I think I like my informal drawing. Now, imagine that you can reach in and magically catalyze reactions. If you catalyze a reaction, change the white box to red and color the arrows coming into and out of it red. So let's watch. So here's a little bit later. I'm I'm, somehow reactions are getting catalyzed. I haven't showed you or told you how. So that reaction has turned red, and this one has turned red, and that's turned red. Notice they're not connected to one another, right? It's just like the button and thread thing. What if more reactions are catalyzed and more of these black lines turn red? They're going to they're get connected. It's going to be the same phase transition, fundamentally. And here it is. They've all gotten connected. And I've, I've drawn the catalyst. That's a catalyst, that's a catalyst, that's a catalyst, that's a catalyst, that's a catalyst. okay? So it's the start of this bipartite hypergraph. I, I assume you all see the transition that just happened. In short, if we take enough molecules undergoing enough reactions, so this is a complex graph, and somehow we catalyze enough reactions, we'll get a catalyzed reaction, connected catalyzed reaction subgraph. That's this red subgraph. That's a connected metabolism. How can we do it experimentally? Well, there's something called monoclonal antibodies. They can catalyze reactions. You could take 100 million catalytic a uh, monoclonal <coughs> antibodies and throw them in a pot of chemicals and see if you get this. This is a doable experiment. Furthermore, it's testable. Suppose this is the case, and you label, you label some atoms in, in, in these molecules, for example, with some sort of uh, carbon-13 rather than carbon-12. This is doable, and then you ask Later, does carbon-13 show up over here? You trace the flow through the network without necessarily having to take it apart. These are doable experiments also. Okay, now, I'm gonna to jump to protocell. So this is Coffin's imagination. I don't think it's incredibly far off. So here we have my autocatalytic set. Imagine that it's an autocatalytic set of peptides, and the proteins, or RNA, but let it be proteins, in the autocatalytic set can also catalyze reactions in the chemical reaction graph. So these little red lines are now somebody in the autocatalytic set catalyzes that reaction, another one catalyzes that reaction, and so on. So there's a connected metabolism. Now what we want is that the connected metabolism helps the autocatalytic set. 
And so I've drawn little yellow arrows imagining that that molecule is helpful for the autocatalytic set and so on. And so the two are helping one another. And in particular, I'm going to tell you about liposomes in a minute. I want this, this system to make little lipids. So I'm imagining that the connective metabolism can make lipids. That's not very implausible. Chemistry fact, take lipids and put them in water. They form a bilipid layer. And the bilipid layer forms hollow vesicles called liposomes. And people who think about the origin of life want to think that protocells were made by a bounding membrane, which is a liposome. Your cells are made out of bilipid layers, too. So this is utterly plausible. If you have this, then, and then we need some way for the food to get in, so food has to come across the boundary. We've now gotten a boundary enclosing the autocatalytic set with a connective metabolism. This system, in principle, can grow, it can bud, and it can have a reproducing metabolism and a reproducing autocatalytic set inside. Uh, uh, Roberto Serra has shown that if you can achieve that, they will synchronize their divisions. So this is on the pathway to getting a protocell. So pause there. And now I'm going to tell you something that I think is startling. Um, I'm doing OK on time. David Deemer and Bruce Damer have come up with, I think, a lovely idea that I want to tell you about. They want to imagine that in the origin of life scenario, there's a lagoon. You'll hear more about a lagoon in a minute. And there are these liposomes I told you about, except that instead of being single layer, they're multilayered. They're called multilamellar. Here's their idea. Imagine that you have millions and millions of these multilamellar liposomes, each one of which contains a very complex mixture of, say, peptides or, say, RNA. Now put them through drying and wet cycles. So you, you dry them out, then you rehydrate them and dry them. And re the sun comes up and the sun goes down. And they ri dry down onto a clay surface. Next, I'm going to tell you about something called the plastine reaction that was done by Wasserlin and Vorsok in 1932. The experiment consists in taking some hamburger, putting it in some water, and putting a gut enzyme called trypsin into the pot. Trypsin cleaves, cleaves proteins, the hamburger, into smaller peptides. So it, it drives like cleavage reactions. The stunning thing is that if you dehydrate it, you take away water, the little peptides glue together again. And the reason is, when you glue two amino acid sequences, peptides together, and form a peptide bond, water comes out. Water is what's called a leaving group. So if you take away the water, you drive the reactants towards synthesis of bigger things. And it works. So they were taking hamburger and, and making it into little things and drying it out and made big things and so on. So the step that Deemer and Damer have taken is to imagine that there are libraries of peptides or RNA or both sitting in these multilamellar things. When you dry it down, you drive the synthesis of these little fragments into bigger ones. And then when you heat it up, I'm sorry, make it wet again, they fall apart. Just many, many cycles of that. And they then want to imagine something lovely. They want to imagine that these multilamellar things dry down onto a clay surface and they're microns from one another. They spill their contents out and the contents from one goes into, the, into another, and then when you rehydrate them, you've shuffled it all around. There's no molecular reproduction yet. It's just happening in the lagoon four billion years ago. So that's their idea, and then the idea that they have is these things evolve in the capacity to be dynamically, kinetically stable, and something good happens. What, what Damer and Deemer haven't yet thought about is this is precisely the condition to get autocatalytic sets. So probably not far away from this would be the emergence of autocatalytic cells with connected metabolisms and liposomes, and we may be on our way to protocells. I think they have a lovely idea. So that's it, 4E. So that would give us what I already showed you. This may not be that far away. That is to say, I want to believe that in the next 40 or 50 years, we'll get these. Careful. People in the origin of life field have been saying for about 50 years, we'll have done it in 50 years, and we haven't. So it's, be careful. But, it, but I think it's not impossible that we can have done so. Well, what would we have gotten when we'd gotten there? We'll have gotten constraint closure, including the building of membranes and doing thermodynamic work cycles. So this is precisely the following. 
we're now at the transition from the inanimate world to the animate world. This is quite astonishing, but we are. So let's now talk about this. S suppose that we have these. Years ago, in investigations, I asked, what's, what's an autonomous agent? And here's an idea. It's a system that can reproduce itself and do at least one thermodynamic work cycle. Well, these systems can. So they're what I wanted to call autonomous agents. That's Ashkenazi's nine peptide set. If you put it in a liposome, it's a protocell. It's already a molecular agent. Stronger, imagine that we have a protocell, um, our molecular autonomous agent, and it can sense its world. It can sense that there's glucose out there or oxygen or whatever. It can evaluate it as yuck or yum for me and make a choice and then act reliably in its world. So Phil Clayton and I looked at that in 2002, and Catherine Peel, my wife, has thought about that too. That's obviously highly selectively advantageous. Once you're in a world, it's great to sense what's out there and be able to evolve to do something with it. Finally, what if we can get it to move? Well, just one idea is the following. Suppose you have this liposome. Many of you will know about a Sol gel transformation. Jello is gel, and you can melt jello. If you have something that can form a gel, you go through a wet, dry cycle. When a region in the cell dries out, it'll form a gel. It can excrete water into a sol phase. It can drive that, for example, by, uh, by making the polymers that form the gel adhere to one another better electrostatically, or a chemosmotic pump. And that now could be something like an amoeba that can crawl around by making little pseudopodia. But well, we don't have that. It's not, it's not impossible. Suppose we've got that, then it's reproducing, it's doing a thermodynamic work cycle, it has a metabolism, it can sense its world, and it can move. Not incredibly far away. We have self-moving, possibly. This is for Plato and the ancients, self-moving is a sign of the soul. It was. So we, we have a vital living force in Plato's soul. This is the transition from the inanimate to the animate world. It may not be exactly like this, but it's not very far from being like this. So this is the becoming of the animate world in evolution. I now have time because, oh gosh, I've got 20 minutes. These things can now evolve. So I have to imagine heritable variation, but I don't have to imagine it. So let me tell you some work that Urstrath Mare drove. If you take a collectively autocatalytic set in a mathematical model, um, it's made up of what are called irreducible autocatalytic sets, and it's a collection of all of these. A system like this, without any DNA or RNA, there's nothing wrong with DNA or RNA, can evolve to a certain extent. Uh, it can evolve. It can, add, it can add and remove these irreducible autocatalytic sets. Therefore, it's able to evolve. We could, of course, have encoded protein synthesis, but that's very unlikely early on. So I want now to talk about evolution. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a story. I hope I may. S about six months ago, I wrote a story. It's the surprising true story of Patrick I, Rupert, Sly, and Gus protocells. And if you would like, I will send you this story. It's a children's story, so, uh, so I'm going to treat you as children. Well, I'm not going to treat you. Anyway, something like 3.5 billion years ago, in the lagoon, um, quite similar to Damer and Deemer's lagoon, um, they're floating in the lagoon. And they're protocells, and they're floating around in the lagoon. They're eating something called stuff. Stuff is floating in the lagoon, sloshing back and forth. And they float around, and they, they eat stuff. Well, guess what happens to Patrick one day? Day. They're going through wet, dry, day-night cycles. He feels a bump in his tummy. And he says, ouch, ouch. And a peptide sticks out of his tummy. And he's, he's, he's kind of concerned. And he's, he's, he's floating by a huge rock. It's actually much smaller than we think. But for Patrick, it's a huge rock. It's smaller than a thimble. And his peptide gets stuck to the rock. And he's very upset about it. And he says, what am I going to do? I'm stuck to the rock. I want to get back in the lagoon. But no matter what he does, tuck and pull on his tummy, he can't get free of the rock, and he's miserable. Then do you know what happens? He looks around him, and sloshing by him is more stuff coming at him per second than he's ever seen before, and he gobbles it all up. And having gobbled it up, he divides sooner than he would have. 
and pretty soon there's two Patricks, but they're stuck to the same rock. And more stuff sloshes by, and they, he gets more food per unit time than he would have if he were floating free in the lagoon. Do you know what's happened to Patrick? Patrick has become the very first sessile filter feeder in the universe. He's become Patrick the first. Can, can, can somebody turn this off? So this raises a very interesting question. Um, so I hope you all get it. By sticking to the rock, Patrick gets more food than you would have per unit time than if you were floating free. This is, a, this is an adaptation. It did not take making a new peptide. It took something happening that you could not have said ahead of time. Could any of you have said that Patrick was going to get stuck to a rock? No. Could you write an equation for it? No. Because Patrick could stick to a rock by a peptide, or Patrick could stick to a rock by some glue or some bubble gum or candle wax. No matter how Patrick sticks to the rock, he's become a sessile filter feeder. So now let's have some heritable variation, and it will work. But meanwhile, there's, there's something else. Um, Patrick has an opportunity. What is Patrick's opportunity? Patrick's opportunity is the little rock and the slowly flowing nutrient stream. So if he gets stuck to the rock, he'll get more food. But you can't have an opportunity without Patrick, who is a for whom there can be an opportunity. You can't have opportunities without for whoms. Why is Patrick a for whom? Patrick is a for whom because he can undergo heritable variation and natural selection, and soon there's lots of Patricks in the Patrick patch. For whom's have emerged in the biosphere? Let's look at it. Can the rock seize an opportunity? No. Patrick can because he's a protocell. So you cannot have an opportunity without a for whom it's an opportunity. These are now emerging in the world. Next thing to notice is that the opportunity for Patrick is just the rock and the slowly flowing nutrient stream. I'm now going to tell you about Rupert. He's a very laconic protocell, and he's floating in the, in the food, in, in, in the lagoon, and he's learned how to uh, attack other protocells, and he can drill a hole in them and suck their insides out. And he thinks that's really great, but he, he doesn't bump into many protocells because they're all floating at the same speed as he is. But he happens to float into the Patrick patch one day. He's, he's miserable about it. But he happens to attack a Patrick, Patrick 7,484. He pokes a hole in Patrick 7,484. Patrick 7,484 goes, ah! And Rupert says, cool. Rupert has become Rupert Raptor Protocell. And he's famous in the entire lagoon for this. He's become the first predator in the universe. Well, Patrick was a for whom, so is Rupert a for whom. But now look at this. What's the opportunity for Rupert? Patrick is part of the opportunity for Rupert, right? Patrick, by existing, creates a niche by which Rupert gets to come into existence in the non-ergotic universe. That I won't tell you about Sly and, and Gus, but they do the same thing. So this is going to be astonishing because you see, Patrick, Rupert, Gus, and Sly have context-dependent information about one another created by their own becoming and making a living with one another. This information increases in diversities as more species come to exist. So these are going to bring forth funny consequences and concepts. Such evolving forms have the astonishing property that each such life form, by coming into existence, often constitutes a new context that affords opportunities that do not cause, but enable further life forms or species to come into existence. For example, Patrick constitutes an empty niche into which Rupert can become. But did Patrick cause Rupert to become Rupert the raptor? No, he enabled it. He made it possible. So the, co the concept of enablement and enabling constraints comes into existence in the universe, at least here. The next astonishing thing is the following. Each species that comes into existence creates more niches, creates niches that didn't exist before in which more creatures can come into existence. So what's going on is that species create opportunities for further species to emerge. In turn, this creates yet more contexts. The biosphere explodes in diversity 
the propagating organization of process that we were talking about 20 minutes ago blossoms into the diversity of the biosphere in which we make livings with one another. We're making livings with one another too. This is, we're catching dinner this way. This is a very strange way to catch dinner. You used to have to go out and catch rabbits. Now we can catch rabbits sitting here talking to one another. Something's happened. It's the same thing. Now, I've already told you this part, the, concept, the function of a part. So turn to three a, 8A. So uh, who can I pick to, on? Can I pick? Jan, can I pick on you? OK. Uh, Jan, here's a screwdriver. You can, it's a screwdriver. I'm going to ask the whole room. Tell me all the uses of a screwdriver, please, Jan. Yes, you can screw in a screw. What else? Yeah? Good, I hadn't thought of that one, yeah. Yes, I hadn't thought of it. I'll just give you some more, but think of it. I want you to begin to feel the following. Can you list all the uses of a screwdriver? Begin to puzzle about it. Let's name some uses. You can do what you said. Can you, can you scrape the putty off a window? Yeah. Not very well, but you can. Can you wedge a door closed? Yeah. Can you wedge it open? Yes. Can you tie it to a stick and spear a fish? Yeah. Can you rent the spear out and take 5% of the catch? If there's some willing... Yeah. Okay. My favorite is I lean it against the wall, angle out. I put a piece of plywood over it, and my first wife was a, a, an artist, and I take her wet painting, and I put it underneath to keep the rain off the painting. That is a dandy use of a screwdriver. Okay. Now... Are the number of uses of a screwdriver infinite in the sense that there's an iter procedure to get the, no. Will you accept the following word? And if you do, I promise you, you're lost. But I'm warning you ahead of time. Will you accept that the number of uses of a screwdriver right here in Singapore is indefinite? Okay? Will you accept it's indefinite? You're ruined. Okay, but balance of forethought. Now, I'm going to remind you of four kinds of scales. There's a nominal scale, it's just our names. There's no ordering relationship in a nominal scale. Then there's x is greater than y, y is greater than z, therefore it's transitive, x is greater than z. Then there's a thermometer, and one degree is the same distance from two degrees as two degrees is from three degrees, but zero means nothing. That's an interval scale. Then there's a ratio scale, two meters is twice one meter. What kind of a scale are the uses of screwdrivers? It's just a nominal scale. Do we agree? Theorem. There is no rule following procedure. There's no algorithm that can compute all the uses of a screwdriver or the next use of a screwdriver. It's non algorithmic. There's no algorithm for it. We do it all the time, by the way. It's part of why I think the human mind is not algorithmic. Now, I want to get to the following. Um, oh, I'm missing part of my argument. All that has to happen in evolution is the following. Suppose I've got a bacterium. This is not on the slide. I've got a bacterium evolving in some funny environment. Suppose that there's a molecular screwdriver, and I say this very carefully, that finds a use that enhances the fitness of the bacterium. And there's heritable variation. That new use of that molecular screwdriver will come into existence in the biosphere, and with it, a new function will come into existence, right? That's exactly what happened to Patrick when he stuck to the rock. That's a new function. His peptide attached to a rock. That's a function in the biosphere. We now get to something astonishing. You cannot say it ahead of time. You cannot pre-state it. This is not deterministic chaos. You can't even state ahead of time. And let me linger over this for a moment, since I have a bit more time than I thought. Consider flipping a coin a thousand times and asking, will it come up heads 523 times? Can we calculate that? Yeah, you just, as to use Brian's phrase, you wheel up the binomial theorem. I love your phrase, wheel up, Brian. And you calculate the probability of coming up heads, whatever it is. It's, it's something like whatever it is, 0.42. And then you can even test if it's true by doing it lots of times. So you don't know what will happen, but you can do what we just said precisely because you knew all the possible outcomes, all heads, all tails, all two to the thousandth, right? 
you knew the sample, excuse me, <coughs> you knew the sample space of the process. So you can define a probability measure on that space, we just did. Now let's talk about the new use of the screwdriver in, in the bacteria that's evolving. It's going into what I want to call the adjacent possible of the biosphere, something new is becoming. You do not know the sample space of the process of going into this becoming adjacent possible. The same thing will be true for the evolving economy that Brian and I like to think about. You can assign no probability measure whatsoever for it, none. There's no probability, you don't know the sample space of the process. So in this case, you see, not only do you not know what will happen, you don't even know what can happen. What I just told you is true all the time in the evolving economy, in the evolving biosphere, in the evolving propagating organization, a process that we're talking about. We do not know ahead of time what can happen. We don't know what can happen. That means that our, our passion since the enlightenment of reason sometimes fails us. We can't calculate what we do not know can happen. This is the becoming of the economy. Nobody knew what was going to come 100 years ago and has come, like Google and Facebook. Oh, now the next thing I've gotten to is the following. And I started on this about last May. I was thinking about the screwdriver and I was thinking, gee, um, there's not many uses for a screwdriver in space with a dying hand. There's a lot of uses in, 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 in Singapore for a screwdriver, yes? Somehow the uses of a screwdriver depend on the context of what's around it. So does the economy as it grows. But Patrick and Rupert and Sly are precisely that context becoming. The biosphere as it becomes creates more context in which more things can become. We have no language for this yet. I think we cannot mathematize it in the sense that I think we can write down no differential equations for this, and I'll come back to that shortly. So this is it, nine. The increasing diversity of Patrick's and Rupert's and later organisms creates more niches. Filling these niches by new unprestatable organisms create yet further new contexts and niches. The total system explodes in a self-amplifying way into the very exploding adjacent possible it itself creates. Evolution is creating its own possibilities for becoming. Uh, do I have time to tell you this? Let me just see where we are. Yeah, let me tell you this. There's something called Darwinian pre-adaptations. So Darwin said the function of your heart is to pump blood. But he said in a funny environment, a causal consequence of the heart of no selective value might be of selective value in another environment. This is going to be the screwdriver. So, for example, having heart sounds might be advantageous if you could detect earthquakes. So I'm going to give you one example of, uh, of a Darwinian pre-adaptation. They're all over technological evolution. They're all over biological evolution. Some fish have something called a swim bladder. The ratio of air and water in the swim bladder um, tunes neutral buoyancy in the water column. Here's how they arose. There are fish with lungs. Water got into the lungs of some lungfish, and it's now poised to evolve into a swim bladder. And it did. Okay, so did a new function come to exist? Yeah, neutral points in the water column. We've already been that. That's a new use of the screwdriver that you could not restate. Question, once there's a fish with a swim bladder, might it be the case that a bacterial species or a worm species might evolve to live in the swim bladder? It's a new adjacent possible empty niche, right? Well, yes, do we agree? Here's what blew me away when I realized it. Do we think, to anthropomorphize selection, that selection struggled to craft a functioning swim bladder? Yeah, it didn't struggle, but selection had something to do with why there are functioning swim bladders. Do you think that selection struggled to make the swim bladder such that it would constitute a new empty niche into which a worm could evolve to live? No, right? Selection didn't try to make a new empty niche. That means that evolution without selection achieving it is crafting its own possibilities into which it becomes. It's building its own possibilities into which it becomes and not even selection is doing that. The economy is doing the same thing. This is Brian's field. But, but if you think about it, once, once there's a personal computer, in its adjacent possible is something called word processing and Microsoft comes with this. Did word process, I'm sorry, did, did, I'm saying that, did the personal computer cause 
word processing. No, it enabled it, just like the swim bladder enables the fish to come, I mean, the, the worm to come live in it. Once there's word processing, that enabled sharing files, and file sharing came into existence. Once there was file sharing, uh, <laughs> scheduling, this came into existence. Once there was file sharing, was the World Wide Web in the adjacent possible? Yes. Did file sharing cause the World Wide Web? No, but then the World Wide Web came along. Once there's the World Wide Web, was it possible to sell things on the web? Yes, and eBay came into existence. Then there was content on the web, and that enabled browsers like Google to come into existence. It's the same explosion. In our case, presumably, human consciousness has something to do with it. It doesn't, presumably, for the biosphere. We need not talk about it for the biosphere. That is to say, the incredible diversity and increasing diversity of proto-organisms or organisms creates more niches, which increases the diversity of context, which increases the diversity of uses, which in turn increases the ease of finding new ways to make a living in the new adjacent possible but empty niches. The filling of these niches by new unprestatable organisms creates yet further new context, and it explodes. Okay, so can biology be reduced to physics? No. First of all, physics cannot discriminate functions as subset of causal consequences. Yet the reason in biology that such functions exist in the universe, hearts for example, is precisely that they abet the propagation and selection of living organisms of which they're parts. Parts exist in the non-ergotic universe above the level of atoms because they're selected for the function of pumping blood. We cannot deduce ab initio 3.7 billion years ago that hearts are going to emerge. They get to exist above the level of atoms because they help you live. The vastly diversifying set of life forms make niches for one another as the forms or species proliferate into their adjacent possible of the evolving biosphere to yield the millions of now existent species in our known biosphere, let alone economy, which has gone from 10,000 goods to billions. Why? It's the same explosion. We have no theory for it either. So the next thing to tell you is that functions are part of the phase space of biological evolution. I'll finish in two minutes. Functions are part of the phase space of biological evolution. The function of your heart is to pump blood. That's why it exists in the universe. But if they're part of the phase space of biological evolution, we cannot pre-state the ever-changing phase space of biological evolution. This is something I did with Mael Monteville and Giuseppe Longo in 2011 or 12. This means the following. Unlike physics, we can write no equation whatsoever, no equations of motion for the emergence. Therefore, we can't integrate those equations. We don't have any equations of motion whatsoever for the becoming of the biosphere. None for the specific becoming of the biosphere. Therefore, we can't integrate these equations. Therefore, we do not have any entailing laws. There's no entailing laws whatsoever for what's outside the door in the biosphere, none. In Newton, you have entailing laws. In quantum mechanics, you have entailing laws. There's no entailing laws at all for your becoming in the past three billion years. So there's no laws for our biosphere. Since the biosphere, uh, since the highly complex biosphere evolving as part of the universe, reduction is, which is the dream of a final theory that entails all that comes to exist, is just false. It's beautiful in physics. It does not work. We are attacking reductionism at its guts. Nevertheless, you, you can get to Saturn using Newton. So we have to think, when can we have law and when not and why? And I don't think we know the answer to that yet. So I'm going to end by saying this. We can hope for statistical laws. Um, uh, Stefan uh, Turner is in the audience, and he's, another, he's an example of this. Uh, so I want to tell you about some beautiful work Strogatz and Leto have done. They made a, a modified, so I'm turning from this. In a way, what I've given you is the conclusion. The becoming of the biosphere is this exploding diversity of animate life in unpredictable ways, creating niches for one another that can't be said and creates its own amplifying diversity of niches. Can we hope for laws? I think we can hope for statistical laws. One example that, in fact, uh, Stefan Turner, who's in this room, did years ago, if you look at the number of species per genus and genera per family, it turns out to be a power law. Um, Stefan has made a model that does that. It doesn't say 
who's what. It doesn't say which species and which genus. It just gives you the statistical distribution. Beautiful paper by Strogatz and Leto models the, this adjacent possible, the unprestatable adjacent possible. Some of you know the Paglia urn model. You have a pot filled with white and black uh, little balls. You pick out a white ball, they're 50-50. If you pick out a white ball, you put it back and put in an extra white ball. If you pick out a black ball, you put it back and put in an extra black ball. And the question is that I learned from Brian years ago, in the long term, what's the ratio of black to white? That turns out to be anything between zero and one. So what Strogatz and Leto have done, they've modified that. So when you pick out a black ball, you might put in a new color. That's the adjacent possible. And they're able to derive from it Heap's law and Zipp's law and fit all kinds of interesting data. They don't tell you which, which. They just get the statistical distribution. Can we hope for statistical laws? I think so. Can we get, and, 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 and Stefan's worked on this. I worked on it years ago. It's self-organized criticality of Bakhting and Wiesenfeld. Uh, if you look at the distribution of extinction events in the record, it's a power law. If you look for the lifetime distributions of species, one can derive it, and a lot of people have. Not which species, but statistical laws. So let me summarize, because I think I'm done. The vast emergent becoming of the biosphere is beyond physics, but it's based on it. This is life, literally con constructing itself and enabling its own vast evolutionary diversification here and on any biosphere in the universe. If among the 100 billion solar systems that are estimated out there, why 100 billion? There's on the order of 20 times 10 to the 12th galaxies, no, stars, and it's estimated that 10% of them have solar systems. So that's 100 billion solar systems. Suppose that a fair number of them have biospheres. They become in something like the way that I just told you. I think that something is going on here that's as big as physics. It's the becoming of things that are beyond physics leaving out consciousness and economies. And this is the emergence of life beyond physics. Thank you. So we now have about 15 minutes for questions. Great. Thank you for the fantastic talk. So um, I guess as a quantum physicist, I feel somewhat compelled to defend physics slightly. To what? To, uh, to defend physics slightly. Fine. But, but uh, I would like to say that I, the traditional physics view is reductionism, and I agree with that. That's sort of uh, Rutherford's view that everything is ex physics or stamp collecting. And we now, I think, sort of the modern view is much more diverse than that. And in particular, um, sort of one of the physical examples of emergence that um, you mentioned here is that you can show that if you had a uh, lattice of uh, Ising lattice, so just a bunch of spins all interacting with each other. We know all the laws of how these spins impact. Can you, can you speak a little bit slower sure. for a mere English speaker? No worries. <laughs> OK. So uh, if you had a lattice of so spins. I, so I have an Ising lattice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. And we know all of the interactions of each, uh, each, elect uh, each site on the lattice with yep. its neighbor. Then one can show that most of the macroscopic properties of this lattice is still formally uncomputable. So we, you can form. Interac uh, microscopic interactions, yes. which you can show there is no algorithm to yep. compute its macroscopic, say, magnetism, or any other macroscopic property you want, say, the average two-point correlation function between different lattice sites. So we see this example. So I think this is becoming more accepted in the physics community now that we certainly cannot derive sort of these macroscopic laws, such as, as you say, um, and, and sort of these new possibilities directly from microscopic principles. So can I make sure that I've understood you? So yep. I've got, an, I've got uh, an Ising model as a square lattice, and yep. it's got spins on it, and they're coupled to one another, and they yep. do all sorts of things like flip and mm -hmm. give you magnetism. What's uncomputable, Mira? So if you imagine that is, this Ising lattice on. is infinite. Quick, quick question. Mm -hmm. Is it formally undecidable? Formally un undecidable. So according yeah. to the Turing sense of the okay, word. Okay, so, I, so I've got your point. Here's the question that I know you're asking, and I think it's an important one. Is the indefiniteness that I talked the room into identical to formally undecidable? Uh, I think not. It's not clear how to prove that it's not. Uh, OK? Uh, and one way, so let me, tell my, but I think that this is a very important. Suppose it were identical to formally undecidable. Mm -hmm. Then I would accept your claim. And it's fine, meanwhile, if it's coming up in physics, that there's formally undecidable behaviors of uh, macroscopic things like yeah. Ising models. Uh, but I suspect that this un, undec 
indefiniteness is not the same as formal indecidability. I don't know what would constitute a proof of it. No. One way of saying this that I can begin to understand is, ju just think classically, I've, I've got this object. Yeah. It has indefinitely many causal properties, macroscopically, classically. What picks out the subset of causal properties that will turn out to be of use in an organism like pumping blood? I don't think that that's the same thing as as, as formally undecidable, but it might be. Mm, I think that's, um, so I should classify that things are only formally undecidable if you assume they're infinite lattice. If it's just a very, very large lattice, then it's formally decidable. It's just completely impractical in yeah. terms of the age of the universe, very much as you mentioned. Yeah. We can, in principle, evaluate all of the proteins, but in practice, that takes 10 to the 43 lifetimes of the universe. So look, uh, wonderful. Let me try to let me see if we reach agreement mm -hmm. to consider, continue further to see right. what we mean. This it may, go ahead, I'm sorry. There's one other point that I just want to quickly make, which is that um, currently, sort of the physics of what is work, and what? so the physics of what is considered work and what is considered energy yeah. is rapidly evolving in the last two decades when people are considering the physics of information. So traditionally, we sort of think as a cannonball, exactly as a yeah. picture that's drawn. But now we tend to think about and as people try to really understand what work is on the fundamental level, that sort of imprecise definition is clearly not the whole picture, that one needs to define a context, as exactly as you have stated. So one needs to define work in terms of its potential to generate energy, or its potential to be able to do something useful. And that depends on the context. And one also needs to look at and that means that one can start defining work in terms of useful structure that can be constructed. So one can define the work and energy of structures and patterns, which is very similar to this idea of building things. So that's currently sort of in the area of non-equilibrium and quantum thermodynamics, which um, you might be interested in. I am very interested. Right. So let's, we'll have a chance to talk later. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. Brian, you have the tie. Oh, you wanted to ask a question. You were going to give it to me. I thought I'd do. Is this all? Hello? Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is where uh, Brian tweaks me, yes. Okay. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah, I was going to do a Stu Kaufman and give a comment rather than ask you a question. Um, I, I think this is lovely work, Stuart, and it's a lot clearer, believe it or not, than the last version of this I heard about six months ago. Um, it seems to me this blows the Enlightenment project completely to smithereens, which right. is something that cheers me up a great deal. <laughs> uh, you can't predict, you can't, uh, as maybe Auguste Kant and others thought, you know, start with physics and then build up into chemistry and then biology and then predict the whole universe from that. Um, my comment or question actually to you is a bit like the previous one. Uh, the whole thing reminds me an awful lot actually not so much of Turing's undecidability, but more of Gödel's work. Um, Gödel showed very roughly that if you have any finite axiomatic system in mathematics, it can prove certain things. Right. It can construct, if you like, certain uh, statements that can prove or disprove. And there's an infinity of things that can't prove or disprove because they just lie outside the axioms. Seems to me you're saying if we start with physics, we really have, uh, we have as a system that goes far beyond what these axioms or what we take for granted in physics can possibly cover because there's so many new screwdriver uses that are not contained in the axioms. So the whole of life as it's evolved is not foreseeable formally from the axioms of physics or from right. what we take for granted in physics. Um, my comment is, and I'd like to get you to see what you say about this, but basically you have a system that's very well defined, but it's creating a context into which it redefines itself. Right. And uh, so it's, 
highly open and therefore undefinable in the, in the whole and in the future. I think it's beautiful work, Stuart, and I think you should continue to refine it and clarify it, but uh, what do you think? Does this connect in some metaphorical way, at least with Gödel? You didn't tweak me, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think roughly, in fact, I think what you think, uh, and this comes to what uh, Mela said too. I, I do not think this is the same as Gödel's theorem. I think I can say why. Gödel starts with a set of axioms. Yeah. For example, the axioms are, of arithmetic, and he, he showed in 33 or whenever it was that from those, as you said, and we all know, you can drive a statement that says about itself, I am, I, am, I, I am not derivable as a theorem from the axioms, and therefore mathematics is incomplete, and you're stuck. Uh, and so people are worried, like Hawking's, about whether this means that there's no real physics down there because we can never state the laws. At issue is whether or not the indefiniteness that, that we agreed to before is, and I, I think I said it, is identical to Goering's theorem, Gödel's theorem. I think not, and I think I can begin to say why not, what are the axioms for the becoming of the biaser? No, I have no idea what the axioms are. Hang on, I'm, I'm not talking literally, I'm saying metaphorically. Oh, metaphorically. There are things that a physical system cannot cover in Yes, advance. okay, oh good. I'm sorry, Brian, I missed what you said. So, let me restate it. Given a set of axioms, there's a bunch of things that can be proven. There's other things that are true, given the axioms, even if you can't prove them. There's other stuff that just stuff. It's not in the language set defined by that set of axioms. The question is whether the evolving biaser is like that. Metaphorically, something like that is right. Let's accept it. If that's true, above the level at which animate matter arises and blossoms forth to create its own ways of living together, when, when, when Patrick comes into existence, so does Rupert, um, it's not prestatable. Uh, there's no laws for it, yet it becomes, yet it blossoms. It's Heraclitus, as, as, as George said. You cannot step into the same river twice. It is a becoming that may be present on 10 to the 11th or 10 to the 12th planetary systems. We don't know. It's, in a funny sense, it's as big as physics. Yeah. And we don't know what we're talking about. I'm just astonished by it. Maybe bigger. Maybe bigger, good. Okay, so it's to just a, a very brick quick question, um, you say, okay, I, I can live with the fact that, you know, there isn't, it's not physics that we're talking about here, but when you describe this whole process from, from autocatalytic systems all the way to the, you know, emergence of life, um, it seems like it's algorithmic. So it seems to me that uh, I should be able to capture your talk and all the elements that you speak about into some kind of algorithm that then reproduces what you were talking about. So. Is, are these processes you were talking about, are these algorithmic rather than physics, physical? Can we capture what you describe in algorithms without actually really knowing what it's going to do, but we know the rules that constitute the algorithm? So, thanks, Peter. There's something very interesting going on to me here. Think of this binary polymer model. I have things that I called molecules and things that I called reactions and things that I called catalysis. They don't have to be molecules and catalysis by molecules and reactions. So for example, uh, think of the economy. And I take two boards and a nail, they're input goods. I take a hand and a hammer, the hand and the hammer nail the two boards together, they're a production function, and the product is two boards nailed together. The hammer is a catalyst, it's not used up in the process, but it's created by the economy. The economy is also a collectively autocatalytic set. The theory that I gave you is about things, transformations of things, and things helping or hindering those transformations. That's in that, that's in that bipartite hypergraph. It doesn't matter what the things are. So this is very strange. This is a body of theory that is independent of the underlying physics. That doesn't get you the work part. That takes reactions and non-equilibrium reactions and constrained release of energy to get to Mael and, and Mateo. In that sense, the theory is Schrodinger wondered, I'm backing up, Schrodinger wondered whether or not life would require a new law of physics. If the emergence of autocatalytic sets is how life gets going, and it's plausible that it is, we don't know, 
It's not a law of physics. It's something else. Maybe it's, a ma it's, it's mathematical organization of some kind. That part is, in that sense, I think, algorithmic. Once we've got protocells, I think their becoming is unprestatable and not algorithmic. But what's that transition? So there's so many puzzling things here. I began by telling you that Erstroth Mari was writing this paper on open-ended evolution. People are beginning to worry what gives rise to open-ended evolution. It's an interesting fact that people who have created algorithmic models for evolution, like, like Tierra and A-Life and, and so on, not A-Life, uh, I'll remember it in a minute. Nobody's got an open-ended evolution of an algorithmic system so far. It may be that one does. Something else is going on. I just want to mention something else that, that having mentioned Schrodinger that I've been thinking about in the last couple of months. Schrodinger famously says in What is Life, asking what the gene is going to be. Are you familiar with what he says? It's, it's astonishing. He says, it's not going to be a periodic crystal. I'm quoting him. They are dull. It's going to be an aperiodic crystal that contains a code for the organism. A periodic crystal to code that became DNA, RNA, and the genetic code. Well, think about it for a moment. What's an aperiodic crystal? It's it's a solid that has lots of broken symmetries. Those broken symmetries can be boundary conditions on the release of energy that does work, that makes more symmetries come into existence that are broken. That's what life is doing. We are constructing low energy structures like membranes and organelles and so on that constrain the release of energy that does work by which more complicated things build themselves. We don't know how to talk about this yet, Peter, but it's lying close to us. Just one last question. Wonderful talk, Stuart. Thank you. Here I am. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm curious about the role of information. And we're talking about work and energy. But clearly Im embedded in this, and in, in one form or another, is the exchange of information yes. or the structuring by information. Yes. And therefore, also the question of how that plays not as an energetic process, but in one in which information can be distributed without loss of energy, in essence. I mean, it is an, uh, yeah. uh, certainly a, um, uh, an entropic issue, but it may or may not enter into the, your sort of proto-life issue. And I just wondered if you can elaborate a little bit on that. It puzzles me. It puzzles me, too. So, well, I'll, maybe I'll take about two minutes and then come back to Mira and ask him something. We all know Shannon information, okay? Shannon information would contain no information if it were not the case that if you take the bit string 1111, one of those bits could not have been zero. Information requires that it could have been different. That's one thing to know. I think that's based in quantum mechanics, where if, if measurement's real, the results can have been different, okay? That's one thing. Second thing is, in Shannon's case, you pre-state the set of bit strings. You know ahead of time. I've got bit strings length n, and I've got so many 1111s and so many 1110s. That's, that's p log p now becomes the entropy of the source. But you knew ahead of time, you knew ahead of time, what the set of possible bit strings was so you could define information. How do you define information for the becoming of a biosphere when you don't know what the bit strings are going to be? You don't know how to sample the process. You don't know the, for Shannon, you know the sample space of the process. You don't know the sample space of the process for the becoming of the biosphere. I don't know how to define information. But there's two other senses that might help. Once you've got constraints on the release of energy for the propagating work, that's a kind of instructional constraint that sort of says, do this rather than that. Fire the cannonball that way, not out that way. That are mutually constructing one another. Um, there's a kind of a sense of information in that it's a direction of the release of energy, a constraint on it comes to be established. The second thing that I, I'm thinking about, and, and I invite you to think about too, when Rupert and Patrick and Sly, who doesn't know that his name is pejorative, and, and, uh, and Gus come into existence, they make their livings with one another. Somehow they have information around and about one another. It's some kind of context-dependent getting on with it that it seems that we don't know how to talk about 
And as it proliferates and there's more species, there's more ways to get on with one another and make a living. And it's the same thing in the economy. Nobody made livings of selling things on the internet a thousand years ago. We do now. Th there's something in this. I don't know what it is, but you can feel it. Yeah, we don't have time for more questions, so let's thank Stuart again. Thank as you. A, yeah, and as a token of appreciation, uh, I'm told by Jan to give uh, this uh, thumbs up to Stuart. <laughs> thank and you. have a picture taken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.